Go where your best prayers take you. Unclench the fists of your spirit and take it easy. Breathe deeply of the glad air and live one day at a time. Know that you are precious and learn to trust. Amen. Well, good morning to all of you. It's great to see everybody on this wonderful morning. We were trying to figure out earlier what morning it was because it's not raining, and so it can't be a Sunday. Go figure. And I was thinking about Tom's sermon, and those of you who were here last week know you heard a great sermon. If you didn't hear it, listen to it online. And I've thought about Tom um, nudging us into summer to look at the small things. And I swear I've spent the week doing small things, riding bikes, I had my first tomato off my tomato plants yesterday before the squirrels get them. Um, just a whole, just all week long of enjoying that rhythm. And I hope you have some rhythm that way these next weeks because it's the time to do it. Tom is dead on track about that. And I want to tell you a story about a, a golf story I just read the other day. It's fabulous about Bob, and he was taking that, that advice seriously. And he and his golfing buddies, his weekly crew, decided they'd go do a little road trip and go play a course they'd always wanted to play in upstate New York. Those of you who are golfers probably know where that is. Um, it's a famous old course. It is a, a, a public course, and they have this old-fashioned thing in that they have a starter's booth at the first tee. So when you go, they announce, it'd be like Ross, and then they would say the names of the players. You're on the tee box, it's 810, and then you all hit. And so Bob's crew was announced. They got up on the tee. The three guys hit. Bob was last. He hit. Um, and then they started walking forward. But Bob walked a little bit, and he walked off what's called the men's tee into the four tees. Sorry, ladies. Call it the ladies' tee. Just about 25 feet down. Well, he stopped. Well, the starter said, will the gentleman on the ladies' tee please move on? Nothing. He said it again. Will the male golfer on the women's tee please move ahead? And Bob looked back and said, Will the starter shut up so I can hit my second shot? <laughs> Is that great? There you go. All right, I want you to think about second shots today. I want you to hold that, don't lose it, because we worship a God of second shots. Really and truly. A God of second shots is what we're about. You know, most of us are focused on the first shot. I don't know where I got that, but I got it a lot. A whole lot. That first shot, the big shot. And we act as if everything has to do with that first shot. And it's not that it's unimportant, but we act like it's the only one we have. And then after that, it's all downhill particularly if it goes badly. Let me tell you about a young man I met. He had been in business for several years. He was still pretty young, was not happy, and needed something more in life. Just kept saying, I need meaning in my life. So he went to see his priest. Well, his priest sent him to his bishop. His bishop sent him to seminary. Um, and he went to Catholic seminary, was ordained, and then joined the Jesuits became a monk. And his first jobs after seminary weren't very fulfilling, frankly. They were more like kind of what he had done before, pushing paper. And he always wanted to make a contribution. And then he got the assignment that he wanted, the Jesuit refugee services in Nairobi, Kenya. It's a big operation. So they sent him there. And he went with a great deal of enthusiasm because it really was what he wanted to do in life, make an impact. And he worked hard, extremely hard. In fact, he worked so hard that he was so tired at times that he couldn't sleep. He was not eating well because no one eats well in Nairobi, Kenya, actually, that's working with the poor. And life was just draining, so draining that he got mononucleosis and got sick. He got sick, he got in bed. When he got in bed, he was depressed. Then he realized he'd kind of been depressed before. Because, see, he really didn't feel up to the work that he was doing, and he had left something to go do this, and now what do you do? And in bed he thought, I don't have the stamina for this. I'm not good at this. I, what in the world? But while in bed he started paying attention. Not only to himself, but the people he was actually serving. 
He was in the camp with them. He couldn't work, so he'd get up and walk around. And so he would walk around and look at the very refugees he was supposed to be taking care of. And he watched them. And he found that they were amazingly resourceful and amazingly joyful, even though they were poor, incredibly poor. And they hadn't lost any of the tricks that they had learned growing up. They could do anything, make anything. With the least scraps, they could devise something. And he also watched that they were, they were craftspeople, naturally. They would take bolts of cloth, brightly colored cloth, make clothes. They could take things and embroider them and make them beautiful, something simple. He watched women make baskets, men carve. And then an idea came to him. Why didn't they take these things and sell them and help these people help themselves? And that's exactly what they did. While he was on his sickbed, he storm brainstormed an idea that came to fruition so that they would sell these goods to wealthier Kenyans. Then he got the idea to help them import or export those to the United States, and they still <laughs> do today, and sell those great crafts and other things here in the United States for money. See, this monk had been in his first life an accountant and had been in marketing. And now he was actually drawing on the education and the, the experience that he had had in his first life. In fact, he was actually using it in a way that he had always wanted to use it. There's an old African saying that goes like this, God writes straight with crooked lines. God helps you and, my, you and me write our lives straight with the crooked lines that make it up. And so much of our, our life, and yes, even that first shot, I think, may seem crooked, but maybe. I know I'm pushing a little bit. You're Westerners, you're Americans. I know this is tough. But maybe, just maybe, it's true. You know, I know one thing, that our society is preoccupied by first shots and big shots, period. Great, Scott, look at all the books, the videos, the infomercials showing you how to hit the big one, how to land that thing that will make you happy and satisfied. And internally, we've got this great thing in us. We are industrious. I mean, we really are. We are hardworking people, sometimes to our own detriment, actually, but we work hard. We know to build those dreams. So we build toward that work that we've always wanted to do the house, the neighborhood we've always wanted, the club, the group we've always wanted to be in. We work to build those things up that will make us happy. Nothing wrong with that. But honestly, my experience, which is not just mine, it's me living with you for lots of years, more than I want to admit sometimes, and watching you and seeing what you teach me, is that life actually begins once we've reached that place. Once we've reached the place that we thought we would end, that's when life begins. That's when we have to kind of sort it all out. Because you see, once we're at that place, it's seldom the place we thought it would be. It never is. And actually, I think that's good news. You know, this last week we've been preoccupied by a big shot story, haven't we? The lottery. And the woman who let the other woman get ahead of her, the young woman let the 84-year-old go ahead of her, and she won the lottery. And the speculation was, what if she had stayed in line? And all her coworkers were kind of upset about that. I don't know about that. They say the randomness of the computer and the way it works is never going to work that way. But... The speculation's been fun, but this woman won 300 and something million dollars just like that. You know, it's fascinating, we all know it, that so many people who win the lottery, their lives don't improve. In fact, their lives get worse. Their lives don't improve. Let me say that again in case you were asleep. Their lives actually get worse. And there's tremendous documentation to show it. Don't hear me putting folks down. You see, it's speaking to something in every one of us. I think it's our magical thinking. We are magical thinkers. And I sure had a big dose of it 
I've wondered where I got it. That there is something out there that will cure everything about me and my life if I will only get there. And some of those things, I got there and it didn't cure them. You see, that's what the gospel story really is. Not a magical story, but a healing and miracle story about Jesus. It's so short, we almost miss it. It's one of those we don't even remember. Jesus kind of cruises and walks into a funeral procession, touches the funeral beard that this young man is on. By the way, he has just died. He's only been dead a few hours. And he pops wide awake, gets off the bed, and goes on with life. He said, the story is a miracle story, but it really is a metaphor. A metaphor, a pretty important one, that I really hope you'll take, ingest, hold, honor today. Take it with you. It's very important. The metaphor is lots of us think we're dead and we are not. Lots of us experience deadly experiences. Thank God we are not dead. And I would say the story is trying to say gently that in God we are not dead. And that's because the people in the story show us the meaning. It's real simple. They say at the end, did you see it? God has visited us. You catch it? They get what the story means. The man got off his funeral beer and went off with life. God is with us. He visits us so we get off our funeral beers and get on with life. That's what you and I are able to do. God is visiting us always. Whether you have a lot of money or no money. But I ran across a woman the other day that has a tremendous amount of money. And her story just, well, it rocked me, to be honest. You may know her, know of her. Her name is uh, Patty Stounsifer. She worked for Bill Gates as a young person. She's kind of a geek. She made something the first run out that cost millions to produce. It was called Software Bob. Any of you remember that? It was a little dog that barked and told you how to use your software. It didn't make it, by the way. Millions went down the tube, and then she just kept working, and then she created this thing called Expedia. Heard of that? <laughs> that was the first of several kind of successes and made her fabulously wealthy. And then she got divorced, single parent of two, and she was out of gas. Had no idea what to do next. So she stepped back, and people gave her all kind of advice. You're so smart, go be a college president. She tried that, didn't want to. Go start a company, tried that, didn't want to. Be a CEO, easily could do that. Smarter, brighter than most men and women around her couldn't do that. She talked to her mama, and her mama said, what do you really want? She said, I want something to be on the front lines. And she said, well, don't forget it. So she went to work for Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. You know, they've got $39 billion under portfolio. They're modest in their attempt to end malaria, polio, AIDS, and tuberculosis in our day. <coughs> and end all children not finishing high school. My guess is they're going to do a pretty good job at it. But she was on the board, and you know what? That didn't do it either. So not long ago, she did this weird thing. She got up, she didn't even take her driver, and she can do all that. I'm telling you, she can have 15 people drive her in a car. She got on a bus, and she went to inner city D.C. and got off the bus, went down in an alley, and she started handing out food at Martha's table to poor, really poor people, mostly, mostly African Americans who have been single mamas of all ages. Lots of women in wheelchairs, on canes, just standing there handing out fruit and cereal and um, soup and vegetables and lots of love and care. And she kept doing that day after day. And then it sunk into her that she was where she was supposed to be. Now, I don't know about you, but if we had somebody like that walk into St. John's, I'd get them employed. <laughs> and guess what they did? Now she runs Martha's Table in a very short time. I mean, makes sense to me. They don't pay her, but she loves what she's doing. 
Somebody asked her, how do you know how to do this? She said, well, I'm not sure, but I did grow up in a Catholic family. There were nine children, and that's just what we did. We volunteered. That was just part of life. You know, we went to the soup kitchen. We put in the new missiles in the pews. Um, you know, we cooked. Uh, my dad picked up deaf children to come to church. That's just what we did. And she is amazingly happy. She says, period, she has the best life she's ever imagined, and one in which every day, and I love this line, one in which every day I get to get my boots dirty. I get to get my boots dirty. We know, don't we, that Patty is showing us something pretty powerful and important, that when we get that second shot in our life, it probably is a second shot for someone else. You know Fred Craddock? We quote him all the time because he's so quotable. Did he die recently? I think he did. But he was this wonderful, brilliant pastor, preacher, known for preaching, one of the most famous preachers in America. And just a great, just a minister, just served churches. When he started out, he was in rural Georgia, North Georgia. And he would go to the hospital because they didn't have a chaplain there, and all the local clergy just took a turn. He was in the hospital one day. He was kind of making the rounds. And he walked by the uh, newborn nursery. And there was a man standing there and obviously looking at his daughter. And he looked pretty upset because she was squalling. And so Fred walked up and gently said to this young man, you know, now don't worry, she's not sick. They all cry like that because they're kind of helping their lungs out. And the young man looked over at him and said, well, Reverend, I know she's not sick. She's just mad as hell. <laughs> and then he said, oh, excuse me. He said, no, no, don't worry about that. He said, what do you mean she's mad as hell? He said, well, wouldn't you be mad one minute you're in heaven with God and the next minute they plopped you down in rural Georgia? He said, do you really believe she was with God? He said, absolutely. Absolutely. And what I was standing here thinking is it's up to me and her mother and the people in my church, the folks at church, to remind her, to keep reminding her of that. Because if she ever forgets, she's a goner. That's why we come here to simply be reminded that if you forget that, you might indeed be a goner, but you're not. Because God is always visiting. God is always visiting. So while you have some time this summer, take Tom's advice. Relax and enjoy some good things. Relax and enjoy some simple things. And maybe, let God help you take a second shot. Amen.